Catherine James. Thank you for joining me on For Real. It is such a joy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked me, Kimberly. Well, you know, I I loved your writing. And so I cold called after a mutual friend, our dear friend, Amy Hansen, mm -hmm. um, connected us and she texted me and said, you need to know this person. And so I'm so excited that she is always on the lookout for me. She's also given me my best recipes for like tomato soup mm -hmm. and bread, but mm -hmm. literature is where she really shines and she did not disappoint. You are an extraordinary author and I'm well, super, thank you. super thank excited you. to talk to you. Okay. I would like to start by asking you about surprises. Here's what I mean. You are an exquisite word crafter. You have worked to refine that craft. You have an MFA from Columbia. You've taught there. You've won a bunch of prizes, both for um, your memoir, a, a Prayer for Orion. Um, is that what I would call that? Your memoir? One you are. Memoir. Yep. 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 That's a memoir. And then um, you have a beautiful fiction book that I'm reading right now a novel and lots of prizes, lots of awards. And here's my question for you as a writer and artist, by the way, you're a visual artist, you do all of the things. I'm wondering what surprises you about your current life? Did you see this coming? Were you the little girl who thought, who said to people, yes, I will be an artist, please watch me go. Or was that something in the making as you grew up? Oh, good question. Well, you always hear these writers who say I was born with a pen in my hand. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I was actually that, um, obviously, a writer. <laughs> However, I did do my little, you know, poetry, which, oh, my goodness, cringe, cringe, cringe. But I still have a couple of them. <laughs> so I started writing poetry and okay. sketching. And, you know, I was a little bit of a spacey kid. So I love um, it kind of knew that that's the way I was going to go because I wasn't going to end up in med school. So yeah, yeah. not, not looking to be a CPA. <laughs> no. Um, and did your parents encourage that for all the parents listening? Were, were they alarmed? Did they want you to take the LSAT or were they, did they know, no, this is really her wiring. We want to blow oxygen on that. Another excellent question. Um, they were very encouraging, mm -hmm. very encouraging. And that might be because I, you know, I failed algebra and they knew that that was going to be a dead end for me anyway. <laughs> yes. True story. I failed algebra. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> See kids, you can find the way that you are supposed to go. Algebra is optional. Don't for have sure. to do that. Huh. Yes. So no, they were very encouraging. My uh, grandmother was an artist. So yeah. That's awesome. Um, did that affect the way you raised your children? It did. It did. We have a very creative family. So um, they, you know, just had access to a lot of things. And our home is full of books like you have in back of you. It looks like yours are color coordinated. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a weirdo. I'm pretty my brain works visually, too. So I actually do associate books with the color of the cover. I know that's odd, but. No, that's, that's just yep, the way so I am. Yep. I that's good. That's really <laughs> good. So, uh, yes, they grew up with uh, lots and lots of art um, and reading, lots of mm -hmm. reading. So mm -hmm. each of them are uniquely, it's interesting, they're each uniquely gifted. So, yeah. yeah so fun. you have three adult children mm -hmm. and you and your husband live in, do you live in Philadelphia still? Uh, west of Philadelphia, a little okay. town called Westchester. Okay. Got it. Um, that's the town of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia is almost a character in the memoir. So I wanted to make sure we're yes. talking about the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm in the middle of your novel. Can, can you see anything now? And it's beautiful. And I didn't just read your other book, a prayer for Orion. I steeped myself in it. Like mm -hmm. I just dunked my head in it and did not come up <laughs> until I was done. It is an extraordinary book. It's also a remarkably honest and tender and vulnerable book. Um, as it's the very personal story of your son's addiction to heroin mm -hmm. in pretty much all ways, Catherine, I feel like this book is, um, a book you probably did not want to write. No one wants to have to go here. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you chronicle, how you decided to chronicle this story in print, because, um, you know, memoir, as we know, is a kind of a snapshot of a season of a person's life. This isn't your full autobiography. This isn't the mm -hmm. beginning or the ending of your family story. It's, but it's a very specific snapshot. And mm -hmm. I would imagine that you 
I, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine that you also toyed with the idea of how about we live this and walk through this. And then I am not writing about this. Like, I just want this just for me. How did you decide to take such care to write mm. such a beautiful story that is also so, so naked? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Another good question. Um, well, I think in some ways I wrote it so soon after all these things happened that it was fresh in my mind mm. and I was basically a writer anyway. And it just seemed like the story that God had given me that honestly felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to write it. Wow. You know, it was all there, all fresh in my mind. And he put us in this incredibly unique situation. And the um, issues with heroin abuse uh, at that point is was just out of control and it was really speeding up. So mm -hmm. I felt might, like it might help. And it might help a lot of parents as well. Okay. So... It, you wrote this, you say quick, pretty soon after walking through your son's name in the book is sweet boy, which is sweet what boy. we will call him. And, um, he wasn't very far out of this situation, season addiction himself. You just said, and often I talk with folks who are wanting to write, thinking about writing about trauma or hard things or beautiful things. And it's so close. They almost can't see clearly enough to write about it. So that's mm -hmm. fascinating to me that you decided this is fresh and raw, great time. That yeah. sounds like a courageous step, but yes. it's, yeah. 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 I, I think too, that when I write, um, oddly, it's almost like I write an arm's length away. Oh, okay. Um, so it, it's this sort of thing I'm making, like a sculpture or something. Uh -huh. And it's not, even though I'm writing about all these personal things, it feels a little bit um, more like I'm disengaged, but also engaged uh -huh. in exactly what's happening and I'm processing, but not in the story. I know a lot of people will process by writing and that's not necessarily what I do. So that helped. Um, okay. If I went back and read it now, which I haven't, it's a thing. Well, you probably know it's a thing with writing. You don't really want to go back and read your books no. once they're done because you just cringe and you know, oh, should have changed that sentence. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so if you read it now, it'd be interesting to hear if you would, if that, yeah. I feel like our memory and our story and the, the remembrance of a mm -hmm. thing shifts in the light and with yeah. time. I think it does. I think yeah. it does. And I think that's one of the positive things about me uh, writing it immediately because mm -hmm. I um, I still had that anxiety too. You know, whenever you've had a child who's gone through an addiction or a heroin overdose or anything like that, um, at first you're anxious. Like, I will never know if this isn't going to, you know, happen again. And then the more time that goes by, you can be a little bit more relaxed. I think it's always going to be in my mind a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, that something else could happen. Although more and more, it seems almost like it's impossible that something mm -hmm. would go wrong. So, um, yeah. So with that, I think that um, just writing it right away was, was super, super helpful. Um, and uh, I was able to just almost like overlap with things that were going on. Yeah. So. Um, I want to talk about addiction in particular, because you mentioned one of the reasons you would write this book mm -hmm. is to help other people, other parents. And you said it's not super common. And also it's so common, right? So mm -hmm. many families are dealing with addiction um, within their homes and within their families and their kids or their parents. And um I read this book in a season when I was just, um, just confronting that over and over with yeah. friends and families. And, um, you write that addiction is a disease with many causes and without a comprehensive cure. And that understanding that, that there are a lot of causes to this and that there isn't some magic solution. Mm. You say, understanding that really drains the judgment right out of you. And I wonder yeah. if you remember the first time you knew that to be true. You know, you're talking to me from your beautiful Cape Cod home. I, you don't, I don't think as far as I know, you didn't have other experiences with addiction in your family. Mm -hmm. And you write about how this was a, like an unpeeling of the onion over and over and a lot of disbelief at the first mm -hmm. of it. Like, surely this isn't happening to us. Surely not my kid. Right. So when did you know for the first time, or when did you start putting language to 
there's a lot of stuff going into this, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of causes and that the, the cure is not an easy cure or not comprehensive right. and not fast. Right. You, can right. you talk us through how you knew yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I think honestly, um, it's terrible to admit, but, and I never would have consciously judged anybody else, but I think perhaps when we started parenting, it was still a bit of uh, a sense that you, if you do all the things right, if you do this, this, and this, yeah, uh, the kid's going to be okay. And so totally. there was this, I don't know that this is still happening, but there was just such a responsibility put put on the parents back then. It is still I, happening. Yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> that has not shifted. Yeah. No. And then maybe the drug of choice isn't heroin. I mean, I live in Iowa. We've had a massive meth issue here. Uh, yeah. I've um, heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same idea though. This undercurrent of if you just do the right things and check these boxes and take your kids to church and have them memorize Awana verses, mm -hmm. what will happen is this. Yes. Um, and then, at, and then you've seen in your own family, what will happen is all three of your children will do this, right? You just have <laughs> right? to like plug, plug and play. Yeah. So you found that to be true, that narrative. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, my big thing was if we had a strong marriage, that's what I, you know, uh -huh. my husband walks with the Lord, you know, mm -hmm. I walk with the Lord. They see this in the house they have since day one. Right. And yet, you know, there's secure environment and that was not the case. Yeah. So, you know, the reality is there are an awful lot of other um, issues that go into abuse mm -hmm. of drugs and, you know, it's a physical thing too. Right. It's really true. Some people are predisposed, predisposed to, right. um, you know, drug abuse. So, yeah, you write very compellingly about that in mm. this book that there, um, there's just such a tenderness and a compassion for your reader and for your son, for your daughters, for your husband mm. and for the lost boys. Can mm. you talk to me a little bit about the lost boys? Because I love how you painted your home. Um, I don't think this was a literary device at all. I think this is how you live that the mm. doors were wide open. You, mm. Your house has a, has been a refuge to lots yes. of different kids, including the Lost Boys. Tell us about them. Oh gosh, the Lost Boys. Um, well, back to the not judging thing. I think this had a lot to do with it is we had so many children into our home, kids, um, teenagers um, who had gotten into drugs. And I think because of my husband's just intense desire to help and mine as well, incredibly naively, incredibly naively. We brought kids in and we told them about Jesus, had Bible studies with them. And so that included some of our, fr our children's um, friends who had gotten into drugs and um, who just were having troubles and things like that. So we really literally opened our doors to them. Right. You know, we had kids sleeping in rooms in our house, you know. And so we'd be talking throughout the night about Christ, about some of their issues. Um, it was just this unique situation. And I like to keep in touch with the parents as much as possible, too. Mm -hmm. Just so, you know, we weren't out in this island and they didn't know where right. their kids were and right. who knows who these people are. So it was, uh, and you know, when you do something like that, you are so forced to walk in the spirit because mm. you don't know what's next. You could say right. something so foolish so easily so, so easily me for sure mm -hmm. yeah so and uh, but you yeah. did that you just was that a discipline that you i mean I, it, it, to me that sounds a little overwhelming we also have a revolving door at our house mm -hmm. but addiction and drug use makes my like my ears perk in a different way and you just yeah. did you just decide listen this is a safe spot for kids to mm -hmm. land and yeah. just hope that they weren't I mean, just you were a safe place for them with, but, and did you have fear around that or how did you feel? You know what it mom? was, Kimberly, it was just so gradual. Uh huh. Was, okay. A couple kids that, that hung out and then they would bring some, someone over. And we had quite a few kids, friends of sweet boys who had been involved with drugs. And so when they heard about Christ here, when they started to kind of figure things out, Right. then they would bring a friend over and say, you need to talk to my dad or you need to hang out here. And so, you know, at that point, it's like, well, this is where we're at. Yeah. I guess this is where God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. And we are just going to have to push through this and mm -hmm. be his voice as much as we can. And it, um, as far as it influencing our son, I would say that, 
you know, there was always this sense that, well, if we hadn't had all these kids and would he have gotten involved? But yes, he would have. And, you know, for all I know, he influenced them. Right. You know, we always like, if you have kids who aren't doing that well, the first inclination as a mom is to say, well, it wasn't my kid who started it. Right. You know? <laughs> so who knows? It could be your kid that actually handed out the drugs. You right. Don't know right. So, um, Oh yeah. gosh. I mean, I think what's so beautiful, I'm, I'm sure you've done plenty of, um, armchair quarterbacking and, you know, looking behind mm-hmm. you and wondering, I mean, we all do as parents, what did I do? Did I do this wrong? What, did, mm-hmm. what, what pivotal moment did I miss that I just kind of skated through, um, yes. to the outsider? It seems like your home was an oasis and a space where people could hear true things mm-hmm. in a, loud world where every time they would step back out into that, it was not, things were not true. In fact, Mm -hmm. you write a lot about how, um, addiction or a high tells you lies. It makes Mm -hmm. you feel a fake love you Mm -hmm. write about. And I would imagine that the lost boys and others who came through there saw a glimpse of a different kind of thing. You did not turn from them. You did not turn tail when things got messy. Yeah, wow. it was messy. Yeah, it was messy. And then, you know, acid tends to be, or psychedelics tends to be an issue too with some of these kids because uh-huh. they're experimenting, you know, and that one especially is awful because talk about lies, you know, they're seeing some crazy stuff, right? right? Supernatural kind of stuff. And they're like, well, where is God? Is this, you know? Right. So it was, it was just really, really difficult to kind of make heads or tails out of some of it. But yeah. Um, yeah. Do you stay in contact with some of those kids? Your your kids are older now, but do you still yeah, chat do. with some of the lost boys? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We do okay. get phone calls, mostly Rick, because most of them are guys. But mm-hmm. I did have a Bible study with some of the girls for a while. Um, so, and it's sad too, because some of them aren't doing well, but most of them are doing well. And it really is amazing to see their lives right now. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. I think a lot about grace. It's been on my mind for I don't know, 20 years or so. And you (laughs) write really beautifully about grace. You, you talk, you mentioned a CS Lewis line, um, that God's grace is a severe grace. It's a severe Mm -hmm. mercy. Mm -hmm. And you say that there are two parts of this, that the first piece of that severe mercy is that we, it shows up in that we need help. Mm -hmm. And then the second is the actual help. Um, and I think I've thought a lot about that since I, um, read that, like, this has been months since I finished reading your book. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as you look at the narrative of your life, where you see that thread of grace, because if I just read your bio and if I just picked a page out of this book, I could think, oh my goodness, this has felt unfair or unkind, or look at all these potholes and brutal spots that she's endured, but you make a case that you've seen grace. So can you think of, can you tell me a few times? I'm always on the hunt for this, this grace in the wild of our lives. You know, I've been thinking recently too, about how, uh, just surrender, you know, I think that this taught me so much about surrender and not like, um, not in a small, not with a small S, but a huge, like a, a, a capital mm. S surrender, mm-hmm. meaning that when you are in these situations, you have one choice, where else are we going to go, mm. you know, but you Christ and the whole world could fall apart, but you are my one and only secure place to go. Mm. And when things are so bad, I think you're forced to do that. And once you do, you realize that that secure place is secure. It's not, you know, a fake security. It's real. It's true. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, you know, because I think that when you're going through a difficult time, it is always a matter of what if, what if this happens? You know, what if that happens? What if the worst case happens? And I'm just heartbroken. You know, I can't make that heartbreak go away. But um, with Christ, that sense that your what if turns into sort of even if, even if the worst happens, I still have Christ. And that is grace in that. There's so much grace and mercy when you do that because it's, I think that God is drawing you into his arms in a way that not much else can, you know. And the Bible talks so much about, you know, using our suffering to draw us to him. And right. of course, Christ is the great sufferer for us. So I think the layers of grace that you can mm. experience when you go through something difficult as you cling to God, mm. it's pretty incredible. Wow. Uh, that sounds hard one to me. 
And my human reaction to that is always, okay, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I don't want the suffering part. I just want the grace part. I don't want to go through the valley issue. And um, you have over and over, but you, I mean, I, I feel like I'm fumbling a little bit about my words about your writing because the writing is so lush and so beautiful and also so um, uh, direct, like in Mm. the best way, you don't mince, you Mm -hmm. don't moonwalk out of a room when you could. Um, So you write, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, In fact, one of my favorite things about your writing is how you write about faith. Mm. Oftentimes in my reading experience, folks write about faith, particularly many years growing up. I just avoided all books about Christianity in particular, because um, the tendency is for folks to do it in a way that's um, tidy and neat Mm -hmm. and um, Mm -hmm. saccharine, a little sugary, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I saw my experience with Jesus in your pages, because my experience with Jesus hasn't been sugary or saccharine. It's been true and Mm -hmm. profound, but also very perplexing sometimes and and Mm -hmm. even frustrating. Um, and I think that ha- I've learned a different angle of that as a parent, my guess is you have too. my experiences with my children sometimes are incredibly <laughs> vexing. <laughs> and so, and we have these, the, I have my experience with faith and with God. And I often think, oh, I hope, you know, I don't mean to, but I think about my three kids and think, oh, I hope they have just a seamless experience with him and that they just know what I know without having to walk where I've walked. And so, um, you mm-hmm. say there are a couple barriers when it comes to the fixing of our kids. Mm-hmm. First, the first one we have to cross is like a speed bump. We have to come to peace with the idea that fixing them is beyond us. Yeah. And then the second speed bump is understanding that it's actually a really good thing that fixing them is beyond us. Mm-hmm. I love this. I think it's both terrifying and freeing. I think it's true to its bones. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, how's that going? Does it get easier with practice? (laughs) (laughs) And um, how did that, did that shift anything in you once you figured that out? Change the way you treat your kids to know they're not fixable. And oh my gosh, thank God it's out of my realm. I mean, you've already talked about surrender. Mm-hmm. Well, first of is? all, it, it just gets transferred to your grandkids. Okay. So, <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so um, I'm like, sweet boy, you need to do everything right. And those kids are going to turn out great. So. <laughs> and does he look at you with a slow blink and says, ah, are you sure? I know better. Do you know? You know better. We both know better. <laughs> oh, that's good to know that you forget lessons as well. <laughs> this isn't like a one time, you know, it forever. Okay. So you're doing this to your grandkids. Good. No, good. But I know the template. I know the blueprint. I know how it works now in a way that I did not know before. And that is a beautiful way that it works. And it is best to trust God, you know, uh-huh. trust and obey. Cause there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I mean, that's such a talk oh, about a song fun. that you can take in a saccharine way. Right. Yeah, totally. And it's kind of like, I've come to believe that a lot of it is just fake it till you make it. You know, yeah. I should sing that song over and over as silly as I think it is. Because right. Maybe my heart will agree with me. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it is, um, you know, I think that it, you do have to, I think you, you just have to hold on to what's true. It's like mm. scripture. You have to hold on to what's true and what God's taught you in the, in the past. And you know, it is, it's a daily surrender. We hear this about so many things and a pair in parenting, especially, you know, I think parenting is, it's unique in that it mirrors God with us. Mm-hmm. You know, we are his children and we disobey him, you know, and he's a perfect parent. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, it is, you're right. It's complicated, but it is just the perfect, perfect teaching hmm. ground for him to teach us things. Yeah. So, yeah. You mentioned chatting with sweet boy now about, um, his own children his own parenting. Um, how did that work when you were writing this book? Um, his involvement with it, because it was fresh for you, but it was fresh for him. Mm -hmm. So to me, it seems like that would have been kind of a collaborative process. It's definitely your story, but he is, he is a main player as is your husband and your daughters. So How does that work? Lots of folks ask about that piece of it. Like, how do I involve the people who are on the page or not? Yeah. 
Yeah. With memoir, you know, I'm trying to stay as close as I can to truth. That is very important. I don't want to just kind of go off on my own thing. I can definitely, I'm on the page everywhere because it is my perspective. And at the same time, I did ask him before I wrote it if it would be okay. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be perfectly honest. And I also asked uh, many of the lost boys who hung out here. Mm -hmm. So I sent them copies of the book or, or copies of wherever I mentioned them. And then I asked Sweet Boy if he'd like to vet it, which he did. Um, and interestingly, Sweet Boy was being Sweet Boy. And he came to me afterwards and said, Mom, I'm so sorry I did this to you. Aww. So I think it was even healing a little bit, but it was hard for him to read. And I think he might have put it down before he finished it. My husband can't read it to this day. He can't. No, he can't. So um, and I think that's why it's just because of who he is, you know, mm-hmm. so. Like he lived it once. He doesn't need mm-hmm. to revisit. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. right. Exactly. It's a, um, that is an, a kindness. I think that you have not just allowed for those different expressions and different interpretations and even interactions with your mm-hmm. story. That's a, that's a really beautiful thing. I think we learned that the longer we're married, that our <laughs> shared experiences are only kind of shared, you know, mm-hmm. because we see these things so differently. So I think it's, you know, that's amazing. You've won yeah. awards for this book and he's not going to read it. He lived it. That was enough. That was enough. Um, okay. I have a couple more questions. First, I would love for you, Catherine James, to talk to me about prayer. I know you have not written a book about prayer. I actually don't, I don't need 10 steps to my best. And I don't think you would be any inter- interested at all in writing that kind of book, but prayer is all over your writing. All the, oh, yeah. all, all the things I've read from you. And I would guess you've, you have, I know you have, you wrote about it, but I know you have prayed a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, What do you know about prayer that you didn't 15 years ago? Right, right. Well, first of all, um, you know, once you do surrender, you realize that once you realize there's nothing you can do, where else are you going to go? Well, that's the only place to go. And you know, that's the only place to go. And then also, I think that the more you pray, the more you see God answer those Mm. prayers. It only kind of gives you more, um, you know, desire to pray and need mm-hmm. for prayer, knowing that that is really going to, you know, that that's where God does act. And I don't understand yeah. that because can he act without me praying? Right. There's a thousand questions to ask there, but totally. for whatever reason he tells us to, and he answers when we pray. And, you know, we always hear, well, not always as we want him to, to answer, but he does. And in the end, it's all good. Mm. And, you know, God was so gracious to give, give us certain situations that really were quite, quite miraculous, not nothing um, short of true miracles, you know. Right. So that just, you know, caused us to pray even more. And um, it's a mm. matter of just saying God acts, you know, and that mm. more, pray, more, more prayer leads to more prayer. Mm. So it gets Sounds, you it sort of yeah. primes the pump. Uh-huh. Yeah. It sounds like a circular cyclical situation that you see him act. So you ask for more. So you see him act. So you ask for more. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. actually sounds a lot like parenting, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. I have one final, I have, I have a final note here. This last sentence on page 208, I told you I wouldn't quote you to, to you and I lied. <laughs> um, this is what you write. I've discovered that when the murmur of angst begins doing its thing, which it can still do, turning my body parts to wax, it helps to remind myself of that platitude that no one else is allowed to say to me and trust God. Mm. You do not see, that's a beautiful sentence. You do not seem like a platitude person. Wait, <laughs> I just met you, but uh, so what do you say to folks who love addicts? or are warring with addiction in their own homes. That's mm-hmm. not a platitude. Cause you've said that those words, trust God have implanted deep. They have roots, mm-hmm. but you had to learn that. So mm-hmm. what do you say? Just bring this to a really, I would love to hear just practically speaking, my friends who are dealing with this right now, mm-hmm. what do you say to them? And then what do you say to me as a person who loves them? Right. Right. Oh, goodness gracious. That's a, well, I could write a book about it. I bet you could. <laughs> I bet you could. You have one that's actually really beautiful. But um, um, yeah, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of things that weren't helpful. So if that helps to go from that sure, angle, sure. The worst, how can the we help worst, each other? I mean, the worst situation is somebody coming up and telling you about their own kids. 
Um, and I did this, you know, uh, sort of underhanded bragging that parents okay. can sometimes do. You know, he filled out, you know, five uh, applications for college. He got into four and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. That's really, it's tempting when you have a successful kid to do that. And I would say, just be careful who you share that with, because sometimes mm. the pain of some of these parents that they're going through and it just uh. kind of adds salt to the wounds. Mm. And so as far as what to say, um, you know, hmm, I would say that first of all, asking if you can pray for them and even praying with them, depending on the situation at hand and whether it's appropriate. Um, definitely sharing about my own, my own trials through this whole thing. I think that that's been extremely encouraging. In fact, um, you know, since I wrote this book, I have had so many parents, so many parents come to us and just talk and open up and they needed it so much. And mm -hmm. just to hear our story that we did experience these really awful things, but truly, truly, you know, you hear this, people say this, but I'm glad I went through it. That's insane, mm, right? It is but totally insane. It. Yeah. And, and I don't want it to ever happen again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Both are true. But, yeah. But it, it is, I think, incredibly encouraging for other people to realize that, you know, you've been through it yourself. And if you haven't been through it, you can still encourage people. You can tell them that you care. You can, we have plenty of people in our church who had never gone through anything like this. And you knew which ones weren't judging you. You knew which ones really had mm. just this tender spot for you and that they were in pain with you. You just knew. And um, mm. so that was, that was just incredibly encouraging you know, to have other people praying and mm -hmm. who you really knew were, were helpful. And so, uh, you know, and back to the trusting God, you don't want to just kind of come out and say that, but work it into things and not in a platitude way, but in a, you know, I don't think I come out and say surrender. I think that I would just, just share my story because that's, mm -hmm. a, that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. you know, it might turn out differently for other people as far as how God teaches them to trust, mm -hmm. but being told to trust God is just one more thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not trusting God, God enough. So my kid isn't changing enough. You know, even if you say pray, pray more can have the same sort of effect. So just walk in the spirit. And when you're talking to somebody, just be listening to the Holy spirit in you at the same time as you're talking and God mm. will show you how to encourage them, even if it's just nodding. <laughs> yeah. Just so, being together. Yeah. You say you knew which folks were on your team and mm. just loved you regardless. Can you think of anything in particular that was the tell for that? How did you know? Well, it was mostly was when people were trying to fix the situation, uh -huh. you know, if they were handing us different rehabs and things, there was a place for that. Um, for sure. If they had, you know, understanding of that sort of thing and rehabs but at the same point it was best uh when they didn't try to fix and didn't mm -hmm. try to in any way control because i think that some people do have a tendency to want to control things um of course we do in our own lives but even other people that you might not even know that well you hear about something they're going through and you sort of in your mind you're going click 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 there's a way there's a way i'm gonna land on that and i'm gonna tell them what to do and we're gonna totally. fix it mm -hmm. so i think that that um that can be pretty hard to hear from other people. So it's the people who come to you, you know, like I said, and just sit with you. And, you know, when I was in the hospital with seat boy, my husband and I were, oh, I've just never been, never thought I would be in a situation like that where he's, you know, on the brink of death literally and wasn't expected to live. And we just, that room, our little, little waiting area for people who are put when they might have their loved one die. And we knew that's where we were and the tissue boxes were everywhere for a reason and all that. And we just got so crowded with people, people mm -hmm. we'd never seen before for, I mean, not never seen before, but we hadn't seen for years. And they mm -hmm. just came up and I just remember one of my friends just coming up and just, she was weeping, you know, and we just hugged and, you know, they let me cry and I didn't care. I would snot coming down my face. It didn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's a, um, what a gift that she gave and you gave to her that mm -hmm. there, that she didn't let silly things stop her from showing up. I think I do that. I think lots of us do that. We go through a litany of, well, I haven't seen her for a while. I haven't even checked in. I haven't asked about sweet boy for months. Yeah. Who am I to come to that room? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we lose out 
when we don't put mm. that litany to a side, we'll deal with that later and go in the moment. Absolutely. We mourn with those who mourn and there's so much comfort in that. And just knowing other people have that kind of heart that they would mourn for me with yeah. me. It's just, you know, and it, it, you know, oddly it just even made it more profound because her kids are kind of perfect mm. and that she just came and hugged me and she was weeping because I was, you know, okay. so mm. body of Christ. That's awesome. What a beautiful story. And May we all, may we do that as what we're supposed yeah. to do, yeah. joyfully supposed to, no should, just gosh, we get to. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you what you're working on now, because you are a writer's writer and every writer nerd bone in my body wants you to write more books. So are you? <laughs> I am writing on a book and yeah, I'm actually in over my head, 100% in over my head. Perfect. Great things happen yep. there. Yep. It's a great American novel. Uh-huh. Um, Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say on your website, you're working on something about, um, is it a girl, a coming of age story, a girl who is Vietnamese and deaf? No, no. But you know, those words are in it. Um, no, she, <laughs> <laughs> you better Greg me. I didn't write that far down. <laughs> she's a, a mute girl growing up in the Vietnam era. So. Oh, wow. She's not Vietnamese. She's no, not no, no, deaf. No, she's she's in mute. America. Okay, yes. great. She Perfect. has an uncle who is in Vietnam and he actually does something sort of atrocious. He's a war photographer and then his guilt is just kind of crushes him. And oddly, they end up together sailing in Mexico. And okay. And it's right. Okay. So I've learned a lot about the Vietnam War. Yes. It is fascinating. It's really fascinating. I don't think you're in over your head. I think exactly you're exactly where you need uh, uh, to be. Oh, yeah, try be writing, writing a character that's mute. Yeah, that's in over my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds horrible. You're going to do great. It's up for you. You are totally up to this task. Not me. Um, okay, final question that I love to ask all of the people, most of the people mm -hmm. who come on this show, and you are the girl for this question. As a fellow book lover, I think mm -hmm. you are one of those mm -hmm. two questions. First, a book that you've recommended over and over, over the years that you just, <laughs> even after all these years, you love to recommend. It can be absolutely anything about anything. And then is there a book that you can't wait to read? One of my favorite books is uh, white noise by Don DeLillo. It's okay. I have not read it. Short book. It's terribly funny. Okay. It is not a Christian book. Yeah, well, oftentimes the terribly funny ones it's aren't in my a Christian book. <laughs> no. it's, a Christian, it's a book about death. So yeah, that's where I go to. I go to a book about death. It's not a Christian book. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you okay, I'm totally like? reading it. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, I am. That sounds fantastic. Okay. I'm putting yeah, it on the it's, list. It's great. Okay, but, White Noise by Don DeLillo. Yes, and then um, on writing... Okay, can we go back again? Yes. <laughs> You're no, I'm, this is serious. I have an issue and I don't want to get tested for the number because it picks me up. <laughs> oh my gosh, you have it in your in your hand. Okay. Okay. So okay. how fiction works. How fiction would yes, by James Wood. Highly recommend it to my writer okay. friends. So good, so good. So he goes through an awful lot of writing. It's uh, it's pretty dense, mm -hmm. and he refers to a lot of things in writing and authors and situations that I'm not even aware of. So he'll talk over your head sometimes, but he has uh, situations in there that are incredibly revealing. So okay. Point of view. It's a writer's writer writer writers. He's writing writer's book. Writing yeah. Writer. Yes. Anyway, yeah. it's a it's an okay. excellent book. So, and then one yes. more. Yes. Yes. With Christ in the school of prayer. Okay. Andrew say that Martin. one again. You cut out one more with Christ in okay. the school of prayer by oh. Andrew Murray. Okay. Yes. Now so, that is that, and those three are all books that you have read before and you love and recommend often. 100%. Yes. Okay. In well, Christ in the school of prayer, Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. Yes. So good. So good. He's like, he's on cloud. He's like with, with, you know, St. John out there writing. It's wow. You know, <laughs> okay. Those are three fantastic recommendations. Yes. Yeah. Do you have, I mean, I hate to press my, press my luck. Do you have anything that you're looking forward to reading maybe this summer or something on yes. the list that you think I can't wait for that one? Mm, yeah. 
Um, probably the, I love Michael Chabon's books. And so um, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, okay. I believe. Oh, set and in your neck of the woods then. Yes. And it was published a long time ago, but I've heard it's funny. I like his other books. So Okay. Yes. I've, I've read, read two of his and I love both. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. a good writer. So. Okay, great. So yeah, this is fiction and fiction and fiction. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That those were very fulfilling. I feel like we got a little master class on what you read when you're a really great writer in your free time. Okay. Um, and I, I would like to also add that for those of our listeners who are not watching on YouTube, there are post-it notes all along Catherine's walls, <laughs> oh, which is them. another version of um, what it looks like to write a book in real time. What does that one yes. say? This one says kidneys, spleens, <laughs> and other mysterious organs. <laughs> that is so fantastic. <laughs> You're seeing how this sausage is made, everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. This has been total delight. Thank you for writing beautiful, beautiful words. Some of them so hard wrought. Um, they're just gifts to me and to your to your readers. So thank you so much. Sure thing. Thanks, Kimberly. Mm -hmm.